I think some people just are born with maybe talents to do different things. And this was my thing, to make stuff. And I just got lucky enough to be able to make stuff that I love and to help do good. Hello, everyone. I'm Nils Mindnick, and this is the Backcountry Podcast, a show aimed towards providing insight on the outdoor industry by interviewing people who operate and work within it. Today, we're going to be talking with Robert Workman. You may know Robert as the founder of Goal Zero and Bare Bones. However, he is a humanitarian at his core. Robert, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's good to be with you. Yeah. How are you doing? Great, yeah. actually. Yeah. Yeah. Got uh, spring, I think, has finally got here. Mm -hmm. Happy for that. Yeah. Yeah. I know we were just talking a little bit before we started the show. And you said you had a, a slight amount of snow maintenance on your hands this year. Yeah, more than slight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, we had some pretty big snow banks. So. Mm -hmm. Oh, man. Well, you know, I... So, especially with our audience, I think a lot of people are initially aware of goal zero and bare bones, but I kind of want to back it up a couple more steps because your story in creating those brands, I think is maybe the most powerful part of, of this experience. And, um, I, I kind of just almost want to start at the beginning with your passion for humanitarian work and how you kind of started your journey down that road. Well, I appreciate that, and I can speak passionately to that. <laughs> yeah, let's get into uh, it. <laughs> my first business experience actually was is with a company called Cricket, which is in the arts and crafts industry, and I did that for about 22 years, and then I had an opportunity to uh, consolidate that business and sell part of it at that time, and I had a lot of time on my hands, mm -hmm. and I've always... I've grown up being humanitarian. My mom was, you know, our culture was doing good. And and I just, by accident almost, I ended up in Africa and in all places, Kinshasa, uh, the DR Congo, <laughs> and right okay. in the middle of the last conflict of around 2007. You're uh, just straight into the thick of it. Straight into the conflict, straight into the last battles. Uh, and But I never felt so safe. I was well taken care of. Uh, I learned very quickly about culture, where to be, where not to be. And I was invited to go to Congo, frankly, to see if we could help them create some business. And so we created a, a NGO called Taifi, which stands for Teaching Individuals and Families Independence Through Enterprise. And of so, you know, it's like the old saying, teach a man to fish and you feed him for life. Yeah. And at that time, uh, I honestly had no plan in starting any other business. You know, yeah. I've been really busy. We had over 1,200 employees at the time. Wow. And it was really stressful. And so went there and started working. And lo and behold, uh, just trying to solve a problem which uh, the biggest problem at the time that we were having was electricity and how could we get electricity into these farms or into the villages that we were trying to work because without that power, we couldn't uh, even download like syllabuses for education or uh, anything like that. And so we created this black box and I had some quite a bit of electronic background because of cricket and I got a good friend David Smith who knew a lot more than I did and I remember he brought me this he did the research for me and it was it's this big old binder six inches of all sorts of stuff about alternative energy and yeah. I, I said David that is too much I'm not going to read it <laughs> so but what <laughs> I, I so. just want the basics and so we took the basics and out of that uh, was created gold zero and so a purpose created, a, you know, there was a business yeah. there. And what we found uh, by creating this product that was needed so sorely mm -hmm. in the third world that really it was a product that was needed everywhere in the world, yeah. and, which is portable power. 
Yeah. And, and that's exactly what we did. And that's where it kind of came from. And we learned that while we were trying to create jobs in Africa, we created 130 jobs here in America huh. at, with Goal Zero. Yeah. So we kind of had this saying, if you can't sell to the richest of rich, how are you going to help the poorest of poor? Fair <laughs> enough. Yeah. I, and I mean, that's it's so cool to see, right? Because you, there's plenty of other avenues that you kind of could have taken out of that, right? You're running into... It sounded like with your humanitarian work in, in the Congo, you're just running into such ground level roadblocks that you can't even achieve the goal of what you, you set out for in the first place. And by trying to mitigate those roadblocks, you, you inadvertently create a company that on a global scale also has a need. Yeah, sometimes you just get lucky, right? But it's, I mean, and was but that intention too, right? Like, no, did, it wasn't yeah. intentional at first, but of course, secondary. That's fascinating. It became intentional. Yeah, uh, but I have another saying that I love, that I always tell people: do good, get good. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's it's kind of like magic, and not everybody has to create a business out of doing good <laughs> but there's always good things that come out of doing good yeah and yeah. in this case and also and we'll talk about that maybe a little later about bare bones was the same yeah. issue that yeah. came out of creating shelters yeah and creating homes yeah and so always to keep though there has to be sustainability whether you're doing entrepreneurship or whether you're doing uh uh, humanitarian work mm -hmm. you have to build in some type of sustainability mm -hmm. and the world runs on cash yeah. and money yeah and i can only ask my friends for so much money and to help support humanitarian and pretty soon they start turning the other way and running if they see me coming yeah. so <laughs> i had to stop i had to stop that you yeah. know and i had to we had to figure out some sustainability and uh, businesses in my opinion uh, one of the best ways to do that, good, you know, honest, clean business that has integrity and a purpose behind it, really solves a lot of the miscommunication in the world. It gives us opportunity to work across cultures mm -hmm. and without a political agenda. Mm -hmm. And so I love business. You know, yeah. and I think it's really, it's really one of the cure-alls, if it's a good business, that is. Yeah. Yeah. And almost your, again, the, the foundations and the, and the cause of goal zero was just so deeply rooted in, we just, we got to get these people electricity. Let's just yeah. make something for them. Why were there not other, did you kind of have to make it from scratch it, it, or were there other companies kind of doing the similar thing, you know, as, as there, a nonprofit, could you have just been like, let's go to brand a and get their generator or whatever uh there was parts for sure hmm. so you had your charge controllers you had uh early stage solar panels mm -hmm. you had inverters yeah uh, but they were all parts that you had to go hunt and peck and hmm. kind of put them all together okay and so what we tried to do is put it all into a kit yeah all of the elements that you needed to have a solar system how could we move that quickly and implement it quickly without having to have all those parts. Yeah. And so that's kind of the the key. And and there wasn't anybody doing it at this that scale. Uh, there was little power packs, if you will, but there but the people that were trying to create that didn't understand the ratio between solar and how much it really took to charge a power pack. And so they were they were trying, but they were more like toys and they didn't really work very well. And so we, we cracked that nut and, uh, and then the rest is history, you know, as far as, as what we're doing. And Goal Zero is still doing a lot of good. Uh, yeah. they, they still have that, on, that give back about yeah. them, yeah. even though they're, you know, owned by a very large corporation, they still go out and... I know they have this huge product in the, like the Native American Four Corners area mm -hmm. of helping to electrify some of the off-grid uh, 
houses or yeah. whatever you want yeah. to call them. Yeah. So they're still very engaged. That's oh. still one of their core values. Yeah. And really proud of them for doing that, actually. Yeah. You know, it's, um, well, first off, you were talking about all the pieces are there, right? And then you guys were essentially the some of the first ones to say, oh, let's just, let's create the package and yeah. sell the package. That kind of, off the top of my head, that there's such a parallel there between the like early computer companies and it almost like, from my understanding, it's then, before my time, but like my then, understanding, it was like you could be a hobbyist and like compile yeah. and make a computer, but then, you then, know. Then here comes Apple. Yeah. I was, yeah. I lived it. I knew. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah. so. I absolutely lived it. I'm, you know, you could be my son or maybe my grandson. <laughs> I, mean, <laughs> I don't know how old you are. I can see a little bit of gray hair, so I'll, I'll call you my grandson, my yeah. son. Yeah, so. thanks. Thank you. <laughs> Oh, and then, um, you know, I, flipping back to entrepreneurship, you, you did eventually, you sold Goal Zero, correct? Correct. Was that kind of like an easy decision at the time or was there? It was an easy decision. Yeah. Uh, because I had already started the foundation of Bare Bones Living. Okay. Yeah. So Tithe has five pillars. Yeah. Uh, to what we think people need as fundamentals to take care of themselves or get ahead in the world. Yeah. Electricity in yeah. a modern world, number one. Yeah. Uh, food, shelter, water, and education. Those are the five pillars of Tai Chi. And so solar or Go Zero took care of the electricity. So one of our key pillars is education. Like in Congo right now with our partner, we have over 6,000 students from kindergarten to age 12 and, and it's going on our seventh school. This is run by another, uh, one of my good close friends who came in and, and really has done a beautiful job. But without electricity, and you can't download, for example, modern syllabuses. The Congolese children are excellent memorizers. But when I got there, they, they were actually memorizing syllabuses from the 1950s and the 1960s. So they were like 45 years behind in what was really happening in the real world. So if you can have electricity, you know, there really is bandwidth all over the world now. But you've got to have electricity, you know, to download those modern day stuff, so right? Is, yeah, yeah. And, and lesson plans. So you had electricity, yeah. right? And we were able to solve that. And then our education was able to grow. Also, we were able to add security. Mm -hmm. uh, we were able to start teaching girls how to sew because mm -hmm. they could now run a sewing machine and they could have light into the nighttime hours, even when without the grid. It all builds up jobs. That's yeah. the basic behind it. And now, like, and this is, um, we're, we're going to pivot back into a humanitarian question. From an educational standpoint, you know, my wife's a teacher, so I kind of like, I am exposed <laughs> to just the, the educational process and lesson planning and, right, developing students and trying to help build skills and, and young people. In a place like the Congo, what, it, like, where do you try to put your focus because there's I'm sure there's so many areas you would love to try allocate resources for these students but what's kind of like the the first step that you try to achieve we made a we made a lot of trial and error okay. <laughs> in the beginning yeah, yeah. there was uh, I don't know if there's any secret formula but the real thing that we learned is the focus Hmm. And uh, not to get too shotgun approach. And then making sure, taking baby steps, that you have the right people on the ground. Hmm. Uh, when you're working in a country where there's a lot of poverty, their, their, their thought process is more day-to-day. -day. You and I plan, oh, what am I going to do next spring? And here it is, I'm, you're yeah. snowboarding or I'm skiing. And, and then I'm thinking, you know, in a month or two, I'm going to be biking or whatever. I never worry about food. Uh, there are people in our country that worry about food, but I don't worry about food. Mm -hmm. But in Congo, it's mostly it's a day to day thought process. So they think short term. They have no choice but to 
think that way. Yeah. So the biggest thing with education is to help them inch toward a little more long-term thinking, planning. Uh, if you just are taught by watching what's going on and you have no opportunity, for example, beyond that, then what are you going to do? You're going to repeat it, right? But if you're exposed to reading and writing and a bigger world around you, and then your creativity, you know, can start to blossom. You can start asking, what if I did this or what if I did that? So we started small. Uh, my friend, uh, he hates me to give his name out because he doesn't like to be. He's, he's a very <laughs> shy guy, so I won't say it. <laughs> okay, but, yeah. But I love him anyway. <laughs> he's done a fabulous job. But he, uh, so what, what worked was that we started very small and we tested the leaders. Were they honest enough? You know, it's like their integrity level or their uh, ethos are going to be different than us. We can teach them, but at the end of the day, they still have to go back into society. So you have to test your leaders. Are they close enough to your same values? And then you can work with them. Mm -hmm. You know, they're not going to spend money like for personal use, for example, mm -hmm. that's meant to be used for to pay teachers. Mm -hmm. It's that type of thing. So you build it small, little at a time. Yeah. And then once you have proven to have a good core, then you can scale it. And yeah. that's taken, that took quite a few years to do that. So, wow, that's such like a thorough uh business perspective almost to have on it right and like even talking to you uh getting good insight as to the like almost i would say like methodical is a word that keeps coming to mind and you were saying starting small and like scalability before yeah. you really try to jump into the deep end with something like well that, that was a lesson learned you know yeah. i had to learn it the hard way and it <laughs> wasn't for my friend i'll say i'll give you his first name rick okay uh, he he really came along He's a very uh, methodical thinker okay, uh, and very organized and that type of thing. I'm kind of like this free spirit, yeah. ready, ready, shoot, aim. Yeah, <laughs> okay. yeah. You're that's the, the that's yeah. the typical yeah. thing, you know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but there's a, you know, you, but you always an entrepreneur has to have like a Rick behind yeah. him, or or you don't, you're not able to be sustainable. Mm -hmm. But you know, the foundation was there. For Rick and for and then he came in and and did better, yeah. And so that's that's kind of what we do in Tai Chi is teach people. Eventually, you have to let them take over, or yeah. You, or you're not successful, yeah. So, yeah. At least in my mind, <laughs> yeah. I agree. So we had pillar number one was electricity. Uh -huh. Was number two water Food, shelter. shelter water? Yeah. Okay. Let's get so, into the shelter because that is uh, also a pretty interesting. That's the foundation of bare bones. Yep. And food. Yeah. So if you look at bare bones living, and uh, you won't see a tent, but in the background there's the tent. Yeah. Or that's the home. Yeah. So we have probably close to five thousand shelters deployed around the world, mm -hmm. and. Some of them, of course, have worn out, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. But a lot, but if you look at a shelter, that's a home. Sometimes people live there five to 10 years after a disaster. And so anything you need in a home, they need it in their home, which could just be a 10 by 12 really good tent. Yeah. And uh, that can withstand, you know, up to a number two hurricane and all of those things you have to look in. So, we just started there with a shelter that could last five, up to five years, the skin, but the bones of it up to 25 years. There you go. So <laughs> that's kind of like the twist on yeah. how did you come up with bare bones? Bare bones. You know, that yeah. was a okay. weird uh, name. Interesting. But, yeah. Yeah. So it really came. It like really that. came out of the bones of the tent. You got to mm -hmm. have good bones, good structure, something strong because that's what's got to last. Yeah. You know, things, the skin can be replaced or whatever, but uh, like any home, it's got to have a good, solid foundation. And uh, so from there then, again, came then what do you need? Light, right? In it, electricity, which is a, just a extenuating from gold zero. Yeah. And then you have to have things to cook on. You yeah. have to have things to cook with. 
and you have to have garden tools to grow your own food. There you go. And so you look at now, if you go to bare bones living, you're going to see all of those elements that it takes from a home and food. Yeah. Yeah. So, I, was, I was seeing that on the website because I was, I was a little curious. I read about the, the origins of it as it being um, essentially a shelter resource. <clears throat> And then you go onto the website and it's a primarily food focused. Uh, food, light tools. Yes. Yeah. Food, food yeah. and light tools. Um, yeah. And I hadn't completely made that connection until, you know. Yeah. Just so I appreciate you asking. But still, it's part of Taiki because of the food and shelter. Yeah. And it goes back to sustainability. Mm -hmm. You have to be able to sustain your give back. Yeah, uh, some way. Mm -hmm. If you're going to have a purpose, you you, you got to raise cash. Some yeah, way. yeah. And a business, you know, in, in the beginning, a business may not be able to give back as much as they want to because, well, they're losing money, you yeah. know, or they're they're not profitable yet. But still, you can give back something. Hmm. So you can still give tools, or you can still, like I just brought our team over to Congo a few months ago. They did. They worked on the farm. They worked in the schools. Uh, just having that connection to our core. Mm -hmm. And then we support uh, on an ongoing basis some of the local charities like Roots Charter School. Uh, that's an ongoing thing. And, and some of the food coalitions that to go out and feed people. That's food, right? Yeah, yeah. So. Oh, man. And, you know, with, with Bare Bones, was it kind <coughs> of a similar... Were you also still doing work in the Congo or is Taifi, I guess this is kind of a two-parter, like is Taifi primarily focused in the the Congo or no. are you still like on a global scale and was it sort of... Not just Congo. Yeah. Uh, Congo is where we are, where we have the best education experience, um, but we focus a lot here in the U.S. too. Oh, okay. And then when there's a natural disaster disaster like Nepal a couple of years ago, we worked with uh, medical people and we were able to fly in about a hundred shelters, which were like birthing centers for almost a year Wow! because that uh, wiped out a lot of hospitals yeah. and a lot of neonatal care yeah. facilities. And so we were able to work with that type of institution. They had the helicopters and the airplanes. Mm -hmm. We had the equipment. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we were able to work together to instantly, within 72 hours, start setting up these birthing centers. Wow. So that's, that's the type of thing, you know, that we do. Oh, yeah, that's powerful. Wow. You know, and um, yeah, with, like, bare bones, I, I liked it because there was such like, um, I kind of want to get into the more brand side sure. of it, you know, yeah. and just the general aesthetic. I could, I could almost see pieces or, um, this isn't uh, the vibe of goal zero in bare bones that it's a very like straightforward, almost classy aesthetic. Um, and mm. again, and you know, bare bones tools and pots and pans and yeah. utilitarian items. Did you feel like, did that kind of come naturally to you to develop a brand that felt pretty straightforward? You know, like there's no gimmick going on. Yeah, I would like to think that in all our businesses, all my businesses, it's been straightforward with no gimmick. Uh, authentic. Authentic's a really good uh, word. I like that, yeah. The, very much there's a retro look to bare yeah. bones, but it's, it goes, it's really goes to something that lasts, mm -hmm. something that warms your heart mm -hmm. and that maybe it was grandma's stuff or, and something though that you might pass on to your own children and their children. There's some, some things that just last forever. There's some yeah. looks, there's some tools, there's some things that will just be with us. And so timeless, it, they're timeless. Yeah. And so from a design standpoint, uh, we're very much focused on not just quality, but obviously being a B Corp, we're very focused on the environment. Yeah. And, yeah. And, let's talk about and, that. And, sustain I saw that on there as and well. sustainability. Mm -hmm. And so 
from our packaging to the materials we use, uh, nothing's perfect, but we do our best. And yeah. we continue every year to, as technology changes, so we do our best to improve our best yeah. and, and be a good citizen. I'm a tree hugger. Uh, I, <laughs> I've become more and more that way. All right, yeah. Uh, but, I, <laughs> but I wouldn't say I'm left or right. Uh, I'm, I'm kind of like pushing to do the best every day and our company yeah. too, as either technology comes about or we find new ways, better ways to do things Yeah, at every level as we develop a product. Wow. You know, and so you said that Bare Bones is a B Corp. For those listeners and watching, can you kind of give like a brief <clears throat> overview of what that is? Because it's, I think it's A, really cool. Um, and B, it sounds hard to do as a company. It's not easy. Yeah. You have to have a commitment. And not only that, you have to requalify every two years. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> and, and you have to show uh, this, you've done better. You've added, you know. Mm -hmm. So I'm not even sure how B Corp started. When we first got our B Corp, we were like one of only 1,500 worldwide. Mm -hmm. Since then, a lot more people have come on board. Mm -hmm. But basically, uh, I, in layman's terms, it's... Our, our, everything we do, do we have sustainability, environmental, human rights, uh, how, from every part of our product. Mm -hmm. And, and I, you know, I, we got a long way to go still. Yeah. The whole world has a long way to go. But yeah. the B Corp is, to me, really a good uh, thing to strive for mm -hmm. because it doesn't say you have to be perfect. Yeah. You have to hit a certain criteria. I mean, mm -hmm. you have to improve every two years yeah. to keep that status. <laughs> <laughs> so, and it's, yeah. I mean, it's kind of all aspects of the company then too, right? Like, every aspect. Yeah. yeah. From your employees to how you source, where you source. Mm -hmm. Are you an open book? Mm -hmm. You know, can people find your factory, for example? Mm -hmm. Can they walk in and see how you actually manufacture? Mm -hmm. uh, can they, you know, is it provable um like uh, like right now i'm going to pakistan on friday on friday i i was starting to work in pakistan about two years ago and one of the criteria is that i won't buy from a company if, unless they have both men and women working together in the same job yeah. so this is a small criteria but it's it's important for us to, oh, to extremely have yeah. a balance of the gender balance. I, I call it gender balance. Mm -hmm. Because women and men working together, we make a better world. And so we document it and we can see that this lady and this guy are doing the exact same job and they're yeah. working right side by side with each other. Yeah. And I go visit it. Yeah. You know, so I'm I'm off to we have a new shelter coming out. It's beautiful. I've had it up all winter with all this snow, freaking snow. How do lo Lovely snow. Yeah. And I mean, I've had four feet of snow up along the wedges on the edges and 12 and 14 inches on the top. And so it's gone through its test. I'd say so. Yeah. <clears throat> and so now we're in full production and I'll go over there to uh, for a full week uh, to work on that project and several other uh, projects. In Pakistan? In Pakistan. And is that, are they... Are you deploying, setting up the structures at no. the site? Uh, so there's like a, this no. manufacturing. It's it's a manufacturing facility mm -hmm. where possible we might work with smaller manufacturers. Mm -hmm. In this case, uh, this manufacturer actually makes uh, emergency tents throughout the world. So it was an easy, uh, an easy marriage. Yeah. They already yeah. understood. The owner started off in humanitarian work too, yeah. making these worldwide structures. So we had an instant love for each other. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so, yeah, good synergy. That's yeah. I mean that's so important to, to find a relationship like that because I could imagine too. You know, you go to a um, various factories and you tell them about the product, the the shelter that you want to make, and it, there could be a very easy and maybe you had this happen that there's a, a misunderstanding of like what tier of quality and integrity you want the product to have. Oh, yes. And COVID just 
I was going to say, so yeah, I bet there's a lot of hard pieces because we couldn't no travel shelter. <laughs> and our, well, not the shelter, but some of our other product, you know, because you couldn't travel and the language barrier QC mm-hmm. was a nightmare for a while. And, but that's largely over with now. Yeah. Yeah. It's so. all, all ironed out. Wow. That's really, that's exciting, you know, and kind of like hearing your, um, your story with those two brands, it's, it's cool to see it seemed like your earlier life, you know, you were a business owner and a entrepreneur with your first company. And then you got to kind of pursue your passion into humanitarian work. And then along that way, there was just this like, maybe an irresistible yeah. urge or this is this natural talent you have to sort of like create resources along the way. There's probably ADD. <laughs> yeah, yeah you like, don't seem like you're easily satisfied I would, if i had a guess you know um uh you are you were at a point that you could have after you sold that first company this is 20-ish years ago when did you sell your the uh, craft the first was 2005 and i i hang i helped uh cricket for five years yeah. and then i exited 2010 okay and i kind of started uh, goal zero in 2009 yeah and then exited that in 2014 and really started bare bones in 2012 i was i developed the tent yes but then we really launched in 2015 so where's that i would say motivation or inspiration come from because i think there historically there have been other successful entrepreneurs and businessmen they sell their company and they are in the Maldives for the rest of their lives, vacationing or something, you know, and like that. Nobody I know. <laughs> but like, All my friends not, are kind of like me. So. Yeah, yeah. Where, where does that come from? You know, what's your... Well, kind of I, this, I'm like, not motivation? sure exactly, but I grew up on a farm and mm. I had, uh, you had to be inventive. Uh, you had to uh, fix with baling twine. And so you got creative and I, th- it's... I think some people just are born with maybe talents to do different things. And this was my thing to make stuff. And I just got lucky enough to be able to make stuff that I love and to help do good. And bare bones is very easy for me because it's, it goes really back to my roots of oh. camping, gardening, yeah. ranching, all of that stuff. And so everything you see developing, you can see my roots. And yeah. So that's very easy. And the people who work with me do the same stuff. Yeah. You know, it's probably like your company, you know, yeah. that country probably. You, I, yeah. I look at all these people around here. Oh, yeah. That guy's a skier. That guy's a boarder. That guy's. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You, you uh, guys you're live not your, wrong. Yeah. yeah you guys live your, live your mission. And I would like to say that. All the people at, at one level or another live our mission. And we might, you might see us doing a lot of outdoor stuff, but there's a, all of our product can also be used indoors, mm-hmm. except the tent. But <laughs> we'll feel like a really big garage. Yeah, you know? something like that, a big backyard <laughs> or something. But it's meant to be used everywhere for a home, inside the home, or outside the home. Uh, and so, we're, I wouldn't say we are a traditional camping company in any way. Mm-hmm. We're an outdoor lifestyle company yeah. that can be used in camping, can be used in, in your home, yeah. backyard, patio. Yeah, I think that's a really good applicable way to put it. And then moving forward, you've, are you feeling like you're just getting started? Are you, are you, <laughs> are you tired yet? Are you... Some days. <laughs> <laughs> you look well rested. I don't know. I had a good sleep last <laughs> <Yeah>. night. <laughs> so. What, um, you know, looking forward, what are kind of your next, you know, planned objectives? Life always gives you surprises, doesn't it? You think you got it all figured out. And so you, ha- you do set goals. And I set goals. But, but I also am open to the, what's happening right now. I read something the other day uh, that I really like that said, yesterday's a stone, tomorrow's clay. Hmm. And so I like you, that. you live today, right? And 
today's problems. We're just coming out of COVID, and uh, our industry is in a is in a pressure right now because you know we couldn't do anything wrong. Uh, years in the same position, all outdoor companies couldn't do anything wrong for two years because nobody could go anywhere, right? Except outdoors. So now we're having a balance, and things are coming back in balance. We have a lot of worldwide pressure, political issues, uh, that inflation, you know, there's all mm -hmm. sorts of challenges. If you would have asked me t two years ago if we would have been facing this, I would have said, like, heck no. No. No yeah. way. Everything's rosy, right? So when you ask me what my goals are, is really is to live my life the best I can mm -hmm. and to try to keep doing the best I can and have the right people around me because without those people uh life is also not worth living yeah oh that was so eloquently and well said you know <laughs> that's because i'm old so yeah, older yeah, so exactly i was excited i was like you're the one of the older people i've talked to in a while so i'm like this would be really good successful guy who's <laughs> like you have so much experience you know and that kind of transitions i guess into uh, albeit a bit corny and you may have kind of just answered it but what like for a majority of our audience i would say um we're a bit younger what like advice moving forward in life and maybe just kind of like finding your path or pursuing your career what like advice might you want to share well I'm always a little reluctant to give too much advice mm -hmm. because everybody's different. Uh, but I would... That's great advice. I, I would go back to the poem, a poem that I memorized years and years ago, probably when I was 20 years old. I don't remember who the author is right off the top. But whatever you do, whatever you choose, the poem goes like this. Stick to the task till it sticks to you. Beginners are many. Enders are few. Mm. Honor, power, place, and praise will come in time to the one that stays. If you stick to the task till it sticks to you. Stick to the task till it sticks to you. Bend at it, sweat at it, and smile at it too. And out of the bend, the sweat and the smile will come life's victory after a while. If you stick to the task till it sticks to you. Wow. Mm. That's good. I like that, Paul. That's, um, oh, that's really good advice. Uh, and you know, like with that, uh, would you like to share any, any thank yous? Oh man. You might have one or two people maybe along your short journey you, <laughs> you would like to give a shout out to. <laughs> yeah, there's so many people along the way. Uh, I told you about my friend Rick, who is just a wonderful person. Uh, but I think that we get a, at least for me, uh, I had a start in life that I had two grandfathers who, taught me some really good lessons. One was very kind, taught me how to play checkers and chess, but there was a kindness about him uh, that I always felt kind. Mm. He never had a bad thing to say, at least around me. Then I had the other grandfather who was a rancher who taught me all <laughs> the swear words I ever needed. <laughs> but he also taught me a strong work ethic. and. Uh, I was building this fence once for a neighbor. He needed a horse fence set up, uh, and he just dumped a bunch of railroad ties and a bunch of old boards. And I was starting to set that up, and my grandpa Emma came over and said, well, Robert, are you going to do a good job or a bad job? Because if you do a good job, people will look at that fence, and if it's perfect, you'll never be out of work. <laughs> <laughs> so I took him at his word, you know. <laughs> And uh, I made a perfect fence. And it's like, really, it's, I don't know how it works, but people notice that perfect fence. Mm. And it lasted about 50 years. It's kind of because it was railroad ties with all that cancer causing creosote and mm -hmm. everything, you know. Mm -hmm. Perfect. <laughs> but, and then uh, my loving mother, who was not perfect except in her perfect love. Mm. So, Kind of getting that balance of a work ethic and a kindness, uh, and then and really I can't remember when my mom or or our you know the community church I went to didn't weren't doing humanitarian work. 
work. I can mm-hmm. never not remember doing that. Mm-hmm. So it was instilled in me at a very young age. Well, 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 thank you so much for you're welcome. us today. This was um, fun. <laughs> such like a pleasure. You're, you're so well-spoken. You have such a incredible story. Um, and just we're, I appreciate getting a snapshot into the, the wealth of knowledge and success yeah. and insight that you've gathered, gathered throughout your life. So and I just want to say someday you. you're going to be on this side with yeah. your life experience yeah. and you're going to pass something on, right? Yeah. We'll see. Hopefully yeah. one well, day. Well, thank you. I've always admired you guys. You've been wonderful. Uh, and the people we've had you up on our ranch for trainings and, mm-hmm. and done a couple of things together. And it's uh, just a wonderful partnership. Awesome. Well, thank you. And thank you to everyone who tuned in. Hopefully you enjoyed the conversation. If you did, make sure to like, comment, and subscribe. Stay tuned for more. And in the meantime, from the crew at Backcountry, we'll see you out there.